another edition of the Gimme Babble demo videos as an accompaniment to the Gimme Babble podcast with myself, David Huckbaum, and my dear friend David Stupakis. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about mounting print onto panel so that I could work upon them because I do a lot of mixed media work and in order to uh, be able to take some of the abuse I need a hard surface to work on, I have a solid background, something that can take the abuse that I like to put it through with, um, with paints and collage and transfers and pencils. I uh, tend to mount on MDF board and it is rather lightweight. Well, it's okay. The larger MDF boards does actually put on a lot of weight, so I just lied to you. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go through some of the uh, materials that I use, and the process that I get from here to about here. The print I'm going to use as a demonstration today is printed on a very thin, handmade Japanese paper called Kozo paper. I like this paper because of how thin it is, and so what I do is I add color to black and white images by painting on the backs of them so that when I do melt them and I do add wax on top depending on where I size the paper or not wax will penetrate the paper and bring the color up through the back rather than setting color on top and sometimes dulling or obscuring the image that's on the uh, printed side. This paper can be a little bit difficult to work with because of its thinness and you can see how, how bubbly it gets, especially after adding uh, acrylic washes on the back. The paper definitely gets a lot more wobbly and more difficult to work with. But this is a nice small print. This is going to be great for demonstration so that once you figure out how to get this down, you can move this to larger works using the same concept but on you know a bigger scale. Ready row. Let's go over some of the essential materials that I need in order to mount a print. Got my print, I got my MDF scrap that I'm going to cut down to size. I got some uh, Windsor Newton watercolor paper. Get some decent, you know, acid free watercolor paper that you're going to use as a background for the print because if you mount it directly on MDF, it's going to have a dark background rather than a bright white background, which is what you need. You need uh, glue, of course. You want to use a uh, PVA or polyvinyl acrylic glue, which is reactivatable with water, which is very helpful at times when you make some mistakes or need to shift stuff around. Hopefully you don't run into that problem too often. But if you do, this PVA from Talus, which is where I get all my archival needs, in Brooklyn um, is reactivatable with water. It's great to work with. It's archival. It's non-toxic. Of course you don't drink it. Uh, some containers for your glue. One for mounting the print and one very clean container for sizing the print. Razor blades for trim. Uh, you need good glue brushes. This is, I, I, um, I've had for a very long time. They last a very long time. They, they cost a little bit more money, these uh, glue brushes, but they don't fall apart while you're working with them very easily, which is something that it can be a big problem. If you use cheap, like chip brushes, the hairs come out and wind up, you know, when you're sizing your print, getting stuck in your print, which could wind up ruining your print, and you don't want that. So. Invest in some good glue brushes, and um, well, you need a squeegee. These plastic squeegees, which are used a lot for like adding vinyl lettering and graphics and stuff, the nice firm edge is good for flattening and mounting prints. I use them all the time, so you can see how beaten to heck this is. Um, and a pencil, of course, you know, whatever, use a pencil. Those are some of my basic essentials. Of course, you can get creative with how you get from point A to point C, but this is how I do it. Okay, let's first size up our MDF. 
for our print. I like having a little extra border around the edge so that when I mount it in the frame you don't lose too much of the original image. This one already has a black border. I'm going to, you know, give it like a couple centimeters and I want to get rid of this nappy edge here. So I'm just going to leave some recognizable marks for myself here and about here and about here. You know, I do things like that to remind myself this is the spot and just make some basic marks so I know where to cut. I'm going to take this over to the chop saw and do that. So see, this is my line, this is my line. I cut here, here, and here. I make it three cuts and trim that edge. I'll be back with a cleanly cut edge. So, got our piece cut. Get rid of the frayed edges, nice and soft make a mess and we got our MDF block that's ready for our print sized up anyway okay the next step is you know getting some white paper so this is our face this is our face you know, this is the top up here next step is to size up a piece of this watercolor paper for the block all I do is I just flip it on its face so way I get it to be exactly the size of the block because all the blocks I cut are a little bit wonky. So I want my white paper to be just as wonky. Alright. Now we got our paper cut to size for the block. Make sure you keep this piece of paper nice and clean and get rid of dust and stuff. Don't blow away your print. Okay, so essentially what's going to happen is that. Alright, got our paper. Keep it clean. Now what we're going to do is we're going to glue this onto there. This is the side. On the back of it, I'm putting a little arrow to show the top. This way I know where it goes. I usually just put it to the side exactly where it's supposed to. Okay, now it's ready for mounting on this here MDF. So, get yourself some polyvinyl acrylic. Pour it directly, undiluted, into a container. Make sure there's no major hairs or anything in there. Apply some glue. Here's another tool that I forgot to mention to you that I like to use. Very important is a brayer. By using the brayer, I get the glue nice and evenly, more evenly dispersed than with a brush. Apply it with a brush, and it also gives that nice texture to the surface of the glue which just grabs onto that paper very nicely. Okay, don't need to wash your tools immediately. You wanna wash them quick, but because this PVA is water activatable, you can, with warm water and soap, hit it later after it dries. Just a few seconds to sort of just develop a little, a little bit more of a tackiness, a bit more of a tackiness to it. Not too long when it's undiluted, because it's already pretty thick. Found my marked edge, this goes with that. This is a nice, firm, thick paper, so I could pop it right on there in contrast to the thin paper, which I'll show you, that goes on top. Now, you want to be careful here because you don't want to get glue on the surface of the, per of the paper here and make it all dirty yet. Anyway, get it down there, start from the middle, start working your way to the corners, gently, softly. Once you see you're all evened out on the edges where you want it, you can start playing a little more firm. You know, every time you sort of grab the edge, you get a little glue on your finger. I give it a little rub. It dries rather quickly. Help keep your fingers as clean as possible. Another thing I like to do is check my edge, especially when I go 
over the edge of the wood like that, it could catch little bits of glue. I tend to either use a rag or, you know, a paper towel or something. It's good to hold on to one of these and give that extra wipe down in between. Prevent you from contaminating your paper. And working from the middle to the edges, get out any possible air bubbles, which is a great enemy of yours. If you do get some glue on your paper, don't fret. Just be careful when rubbing over spots with glue, because then you could really start making smudges and start, you know, getting the paper is 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 fibrous, so it will, it will start to tear and and get that weird fluffy spot and you don't want that. You want to try to keep it as consistent and clean as possible. Next, after I get all the edges nice and flat, you know, you can peek around the edge here. If you see it lifting off, you know, just give it a, a nice firm push. This glue doesn't take long to dry, but it needs a little help in the beginning. You know, getting everything nice and flat. See how that's lifting up there? You give it a nice firm push. Bring out any excess glue from the set center over to the sides and then even it out. Something else I like to do to help ensure that it stays nice and flat while it dries, get some, you know, uh, this is a wax paper or, or a uh, lacine paper or parchment paper you can use. You know, put it over the surface and get another flat piece of MDF. You know, make sure it's flat like an iron. Put that there. And then I like to apply some weight and let that sit. Meanwhile, you go and you wash your brushes and your brayer. Well, this has been sitting here for about 30 minutes now, so that should be pretty good. And it gives it enough time to dry nice and flat. Definitely want to give it enough time Ugh. to dry. You'll see a lot of this glycine paper got all wrinkly because it's absorbing the, the, the water from the glue that's in there. Um, it might stick a little bit if there was any glue at all in the paper, but it's pretty clean. Another reason why you want to keep it clean so that when you flatten it, you can use stuff like this. The first initial part of the substrate Put some paper down. This way, even if a little scuff or, or marks get on this, it's okay. And it's easier to mount this onto that than it is this onto wood or MDF or whatever. You also can do things like add uh, color washes to the paper so that, you know, it just adds another layer of something when you add the wax, the color from the paper will shine through. You know, get experimental, get adventurous, see what happens. Our next step now is to get this print mounted onto the board with the paper. Okay, at this point things start to get a lot more delicate. So you want to be more careful and aware of the mess that you're making and you don't want to damage your print while doing this. And it's very easy to do. The ink is sensitive, the paper is sensitive, so you have to treat this very gently. Okay, first we make sure that this is the size, the right, you know, direction of the of the of the wood fits perfectly. Okay, our paper is a little bit wobbly, so it's going to fight us a little bit, but uh, we'll get it. We'll get her down. I'll clear off any extra hairs, dust, particles, whatnot. Okay, you got your glue. This is your direct undiluted glue, nice and thick. Don't oversaturate, because now we're dealing with paper not wood. Dab it on. You don't want any thick mounds of glue that will take longer to dry when it's in the center and cause bubbles. Right, you want to try to get this as even and flat as possible. This is where the brayer comes in. You'll see all these tiny little hairs and pieces of dust in there and I mean, my studio is not the cleanest, so it happens. I'm also not somebody who strives for absolute sterile perfection. It's not part of my work, it's not part of my personality, it's not part of what I do, so lucky me. Get it 
as flat and even as possible. And make sure by moving around and seeing the, the glare, you make sure that the entire surface has glue on it, especially around the edges, because those are the parts that really like to lift. And you want those edges to be sure to contain enough glue to hold down your print. Okay. Edges are tricky, I'm telling you. Oh, this spot right here. All right, I'm already starting to get a little bit too wet and the paper wants to fall apart. So go quick and go easy. Don't waste too much time. Okay, this is nice and covered. Okay, here we go. Make sure your fingers are dry of any glue. And starting with this edge and that edge to make sure that she comes out straight. Very light rub down and slowly and making sure she's not slanted. Looks good. Still can move it a little bit. You don't want to warp it. Certainly don't want to warp it. And start moving downward, pushing any air. This squeegee comes in handy. Don't rub too hard or you will disturb the surface of the print. Once you get it aligned the way you like it, then start working from the center, once again, to the edge. Now make absolutely sure every time you pass, your squeegee is clean. You get any glue on this, it's going to make for a difficult time for flattening. This is one of those processes that if you get it wrong the first time, there's really not much hope of getting a second chance at it. There have been pieces that I've absolutely destroyed, and there are some that I've been able to recover. It takes practice, it takes trial and error. I mean, a nice dry thing so you can brace. I also recommend wearing gloves, but I don't wear gloves because I, then I can't feel if I have glue on my fingers. If you see extra blobs that you're afraid of on the edge, carefully get in there, wipe it away. It's still wet, but it doesn't have globs that can catch onto your squeegee easier. Okay, now this was very rippled paper, so you want to put enough pressure, make sure you're getting flat and smooth, but not too much that you're rubbing the ink off the surface of the paper. Okie dokie, this is feeling good. Feel the coolness of the paper because it's so much moisture in that glue. Paper feels cold and almost damp. Right now, the print is in a very volatile state with all that wet glue underneath. So you don't want to rub too hard or rough in any direction. Now, I go around getting any extra glue globs off because I'm going to now flatten this. This is a very important thing. And it takes trial and error to get it right, but you earn that with practice. Okay, now I'm just checking the edges to see if there are any deposits of glue lingering. Feel that tackiness? Still a little tacky. Getting ready to flatten this part now, but first, having it final. And then I'm checking the surface for any glaring spots where glue might have gotten onto the print. And there are none, which is great. Much easier doing the small pieces than large works where, you know, it's nearly impossible not to muck up. But there are ways to fix things. Anyway, she's looking good. She's flat. She's ready to be weighed down. Once again, you know, no wet glue. 
Very important. And no debris on the glassine paper either. Nice, clean piece of glassine. Gonna weigh this down with something nice and heavy. Now this piece is going through its second stage of flattening. I like to keep this one like this, maybe for an hour. Give it a good amount of time, a chance for that glue to dry because the next stage is going to be sizing the print, which means we're going to be putting the same glue that we use to, to, as an adhesive on top of the print directly, but the glue is diluted down to make it thinner and it dries clear and it, it acts as a protectant and it will resist the wax that I'm going to put on top. And that's that. Okay, so now you could, uh, you've got some time to kill. So why don't you do a few things like clean your brushes and your brayer and um, you know and uh, th there's, there's a number. it's a technique that I came up with um, due to my frustrations with digital printing uh, compared to darkroom printing where I felt there was a lot more hands-on um, uh, elements to the to the to the process. Digital was a bit cold, and this was something. This was something sort of bridge that gap. That felt sort of bridge that gap from that yeah. yeah. black, where I mean, it work digitally, but still incorporate techniques like painting and uh, collage. We've had this block sitting on this print for a good hour, and we're ready to lift and see how it looks. Bend the knees! Oh, fuck! Moisture, but that is nice. Now I'm checking the edge to see if there are any air bubbles that escaped me. And there are none. That's because this is a very small piece and easy, much, much easier to deal with than large works. It can be quite challenging, dealing with air bubbles especially when you're applying this, uh, this kind of thin paper onto board. So pretty much what you got now is a print or photograph or whatever you mounted onto the board that's ready to work upon if you wish. You could add color on top, you can add text, you can do whatever you like. It's a nice solid substrate for your piece. What I'm going to do is some selective size. Now for sizing, you need the glue prepared with some water to thin it out to make it less viscous, less gloopy, and because you just want to add a thin layer of glue on top of this. It's the same PVA glue that you used to adhere it to the board with water added to it. Let's do a quick little demo. We'll put this aside, get a nice clean container for your glue. Take some more PVA glue. It's really, Jesus. Fucking. Okay, that's Good shot. Okay, so get your, get, get your fucking glue. Pour a little bit in, pour it in there. Out of order here. And you take a little bit of water, a little bit, like that much, right? Add that to the glue. Stir it around, get all that glue mixed in with the water nicely. It likes to sit on top of the glue, so you gotta make sure you get it in there. Starting to get less viscous stuff. It does not take a lot of water. If you add too much water, you're just gonna have to add more glue. So you don't want it too watery. A little water goes a long way with this stuff. 
still a little bit thick for my taste. A little at a time. That's how I learned. A little thick. I bet that'll do it. Smooth, silky, a lot less gloppy because we're going to use this to coat the top of the print. So we don't want it too thick. But we don't want it too watery either, otherwise your paper is just going to ripple and tear. Especially this Kozo paper is very delicate. Too much water in the sizing glue or any anything you coat it with makes the paper very fragile. You know, I like that. That's looking good. You know? It's not totally viscous. It's not too thin. As compared to what we have here, it's a lot gloppier. You can't see. That's not close enough. Anyway, you get used to figuring it out. It's a lot more like a milk than a yogurt. <laughs> I guess. Now since I'm only doing selective gluing, I'm using a smaller brush and just adding it to where I don't want wax to absorb into the print. Very lightly adding this on top because there's so much water in it that I could cause the print to bleed. Let's get a little closer so you can see what's happening. Angle. Okay, now you can see what's going on here is this glue wants sort of ball up. You gotta keep it smoothing it out to make a thin delicate film on top of the print. You do it in short spurts like that and you give it a little bit of time to dry watching it as it dries it starts to separate and you just give it a little smooth pull across find your edges where you want the wax to resist and you do this all around the area where you do not want wax to penetrate the paper and careful not to push down too hard and not to put too much at once if it gets too wet and too much dragging across, the paper becomes pilly, like an old sweater, and will start to break apart. And once that happens, there's really no going back. So I want her body to resist the wax, and I want the grass or the ferns surrounding her to absorb the wax. So you can see that there is this order I'm making here, and it's not a perfect exact science here for me. I like rough edges, I like imperfections, and I like certain things to happen spontaneously. But certain areas I want to have more control over. I do not want, for instance, her face to absorb any wax because when the wax gets absorbed in the paper not only does it bring out the color in the back but it will also darken the image and what I have here is an already rather dark image for the top part you'll be able to see how I use the larger brush clean off the edge of the brush a little bit don't don't put a sopping wet brush full of glue onto it you see it's just kind of a little bit there's a hair, get rid of that. And find your edge. As long as you put a thin layer, it eventually dries clear. And go back and smooth out all the lumpier parts, or the stringier parts where the glue separates. Continuously doing it carefully and slowly. Slowly, I mean one area at a time. You want to move kind of quick because glue dries fast. Don't be alarmed when you see these more white, opaque areas. Give it time to dry. Don't try to spread it out. 
Don't try to spread it out while it's really thick. You'll wind up tearing your paper. Well, you can use the light to see where there is glue and where there is not. And go over the spots that you want with glue once more. Thinly, lightly pressing. Very lightly. And for short periods of time. Don't, don't do this too long in one spot because then you'll really just be tearing up your image. You add it, let it sit and dry. Then you can go back on top of the spots again if you wish that already have glue because they will be already coated with a layer. I can see tiny little pinholes where air bubbles on the surface of the glue remained. And if you don't fill those bubbles, wax will go into it and create a spotted effect. You'll start to notice effects that you like and you'll notice effects that you dislike and you get to pick and choose. Okie dokie. She's looking pretty good. Set this to dry for a while. This won't take as long to dry. Just leave this out in the open air and in about 15 minutes the glue will be perfectly dry. Okay, let's let this little lady dry and then come back to this and prepare some wax. Hmm? Yeah, it's good. Ah, oh, I spilled the glue. Okay, this piece is ready for being waxed. So I'm going to set up a waxing station. Okay, so I got my, my waxing station set up here. I have a crock pot that I use to melt down my beeswax, carnauba, and Demar crystal wax and caustic tablets in. I make these myself. I'll do another demo for, uh, for how to make this. I'm waiting for spring because I want to do it outside where there's more ventilation because you have to melt down Demar crystals at a very, very high heat. For just melting the wax, I just need an open window and a fan, I'm okay. Turn the sucker on. This takes a while to uh, heat up. I put it on high and drop my tablet in there. It takes anywhere from 15, 20 minutes. I don't know. I get it started. I don't fully cover it when it's on high because then it can start to smoke when it gets hot if you don't pay attention. So uh, you want to keep an eye on it. Check on it every five minutes. See what's going on with your crock pot. And uh, get that wax melted. We're going to use sponge brushes to apply the wax. I like these. They're reusable up until the point where they're totally destroyed by wax in which you throw them away. But um, they're good for, I like, uh, for getting pretty decently even coats of wax on the piece. I always have a little something for this to sit on top so any wax that comes off the side drops onto this extra thing that I put down. It makes for easy cleanup because when you're working on a table later and you have wax drippings on it, it makes a mess on your other work. So keep your wax station organized and cleanish. Another thing I have over here is a heat gun. It's pretty much a paint gun. It's for melting paint for scraping. It's very, very hot, very dangerous, so be careful and beware. I don't keep it plugged in the same time I have my crock pot going. This is for finishing work. After I lay down the wax, it dries. I go back in there with the heat gun and kind of level it out, spread it out, and it helps to disperse the wax more evenly because it does dry pretty quick. Anyway, now we wait. We wait for him to cook. Yes, waiting. Okay, wax is melted. Hands are dirty. Hands are clean. Brush is close. Spare brush is close by. Let's uh, pull in and uh, do a little bit of waxing. Okay, okay. Careful, because hot wax is hot wax. Don't burn yourself. Make sure your piece is dust, dirt, debris free. Anything you don't want to become permanent part of the piece, get off. 
to use this here. Was this a one inch, half, three quarters? I don't know. One inch sponge brush. Dip it into my wax, just so the whole tip of the brush sort of gets absorbed. You know, not very deep. You don't, you know, not doing super deep. You know, just like that bevel tip. You know, gets sort of saturated, and then you use the side of the crock pot, squeeze the tip to desaturate it some. And that's how you, you know, control the amounts of wax. So the first one you want kind of to get a feel of it. You know. Make it pretty absorbed, saturated. Brush across with a little bit of pressure. And then empty the brush and then refill just the top bevel. Brush across. Now look what's happening with this uh, color that's coming through the center, the stripe. That's where I did not size the piece so that the... Um, the color that was painted underneath wound up coming through from the back. You can see where I sized it. It's not getting absorbed. Anyway, do it again. Watch how this happens. Kind of instantaneously. Hopefully you can see it. Look at that color come through. Let's get a close-up of that, huh? See, here you can see where the color is coming through from behind the print because I did not size it with the PVA. And now you can see close up how it looks when you add wax to an area that has not been sized, that has color laid behind it. Pretty cool. So that's a pretty thin layer. There's a lot of brush strokes you can see where it's overlapping and more uh, textured and different levels. I'm gonna let this cool down for just a second. So now it's got a dry layer of wax over it that has a lot of bumps and textures which could be smoothed out. I deal with this with a heat gun now. Plug in the old heat gun. Start off on low. You get in there, not too close, not too far, you get used to how your heat gun works, you start to see it melt down you pull there a little bit, and it kind of just go over the whole surface, and as it melts, it kind of levels out a bit, fills some of the gaps that were left open, and it also helps me locate all the spots that need more wax. I move it around some. Over time and practice, you get good. You figure out the best way for yourself to get the results you're most happy with. You pick up the skills as a practice. Okay, now I have a pretty good idea of the areas that need more wax. So, in my little sponge brush, sort of dab in any small holes first. All right, let that cool. When it cools and hardens and gets all smoky again. Go back in there where the holes were. Repeat. Keep moving. You don't want to burn your wax. You don't want to burn your piece. Start to notice the spots that need a little bit more. And these are the spots where there was no sizing. So it's getting soaked up into the paper and not sitting on top. And that's why you need to work it a few more times. But you let it cool down before you hit it again. All right, give it a nice brush over just in the area where I want it and let it cool and repeat even it out the more troubled areas you can go in with a second clean sponge brush let's say you have puddled areas go in smooth it out and evenly spread those puddled areas Let that cool down. You can get really nitpicky about certain areas. Careful not to overdo it. I always do. Get it to a point where you're happy and then set it aside to cool for a while before you can buff it out. Now this one who's now been sitting cooling is 
nice and cold. You'll feel that it's definitely not warm anymore before you start buffing it. I use a chamois cloth or a very, very smooth, unmarred microfiber cloth in the auto department of a drugstore. They're pretty cheap and uh, they're great for buffing wax because they don't leave any tiny hairs. If you use something like a paper towel, cloth, or fibrous, you will get tiny little hairs in your wax if you press too hard. Don't want to waste all that time putting this together to stick a bunch of tiny fucking hairs in there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, okay, so uh, this guy has been drying for a while and he's ready to uh, give a buff to. All right, this little guy's nice and dry, cool to the touch. Means it's ready for some buffing. Get out some of these cloudy spots. Take your chamois, make sure there's no folded edges or dirt or anything that could scratch into the surface of the wax, which is still soft. I mean, it's durable, it's more durable because it has Damar and it has Carnauba wax in it, but it's still soft. So with some pressure, not too much, buff that and it starts to pop, clearing out a lot of cloudiness bumping up the contrast of the entire piece. It looks like a piece of candy. That's what I'm looking for. I used to only get this kind of effect if I did uh, two-part epoxy, Virotech like uh, coatings, bar top stuff. Highly toxic. I like wax better. It's more organic feeling. All right, you don't want to go too fast and too hard because then you're producing heat and heat will soften the wax even further, so on and so forth. Do it to it to how you like it. You can make it work. Okay. And take a look at her. You can see the saturated areas of color. All that color applied on the back of the piece. There you have a quick demo on how I mount and size and wax printed work on paper. And that's pretty much the bones about how I put together most of this printed work. Hi everyone, I just quickly want to say a great big thank you again for watching another Gimme Babble demo that goes along with our Gimme Babble podcast, which you can find on SoundCloud and iTunes. Please find us, subscribe, comment, it helps us do more. And if you get excited about any of the work that you see here, you can find our work at our websites. That's where we have for sale things like limited edition prints, one of a kind small works, sculptures, all sorts of things that you might find in our studio and not in galleries, please do visit davidhockbaum.bigcartel.com, davidstupakis.bigcartel.com. These are our websites that help us keep the lights on, so to speak. Okay, so thank you once again, and we'll see you, you next time. Thank you very, 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 very much. Please listen to Give Me Babble, subscribe, write comments, and I'll see you next time.